Dude, uh, I saw Dune Part 2 on Sunday. Oh, yeah? How was it? Yeah. We haven't even talked about it yet. It was awesome, man. Yeah. It was awesome. We got to go see it again. We got to go see it in 70 millimeter sometime. What did you, where did you see it? I saw at the Dolby Cinema at Lincoln Square, which is where the nice IMAX is. Um, Dolby Cinema is really great. Some people online were even saying it's better than IMAX for this film because I think this film was shot digitally and then converted to 70 millimeter for IMAX. So it's not like Oppenheimer, which was shot natively in film. Um, I saw Oppenheimer in 70 millimeter and it was incredible. Is that the trick? Um, Is the trick that you want to see it in the format that it was shot in? Like that the camera I th- captured I think, it in? I think so. I think so. Or sense. at the least the 70 millimeter is like the the best way to see it would be with source material shot on film, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but dude, it was awesome. And, and Dolby Cinema is really crystal clear and they have a, the sound is amazing. So the theater in Lincoln Square has like a balcony. We actually didn't sit in the balcony, but I've sat in there before. But that's like the best seat in the theater. Huh. Um, because you're kind of in the middle of the theater and they have like a crazy sound system set up. But the sound in there, regardless, is amazing. And the sound design in this movie is like, <laughs> oh man, it's incredible. Wait, if they have a balcony. It must be a huge theater, yeah? It, it's pretty big. It's pretty big. I think we were like towards the back on the bottom of like row J. C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. So there's like, you know, 15 rows on the bottom and then probably like, you know, 10 or 15 up top, something like that. But like any of the seats in there are great. I mean, the the, the theater was awesome. Nice. It was great. And uh, the movie was amazing, dude. Nice. Remember when you said in part one, it was kind of made for book readers. So it was more subtle. Like it was harder to follow if you didn't have any backstory. I think this one is like... It, they kind of corrected that. So it's a little bit more, you know, like obvious in terms of the plot lines and everything. And it's easier for people to follow, which is why I think it's doing so well, because it's it's just more enjoyable for an average moviegoer. Mm, you know? Interesting. Cool. Very cool. I yeah, remember, I remember really good. part part the in the books, like the first part is like the setup. So maybe that's why, maybe because it's then, just faith, because I haven't read it in so long. Okay. I know you read it re- more recently and the, than like I the did. the last third of the book, the book's like, you know, in thirds, and the last, like, the last mm. two thirds are like, well, I guess the middle one is still a lot set up, but the last the last part is just action. Dude, there was a lot of action. Cool. And it, was, cool. it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. I think you'll love it. I'm definitely going to see it again in theaters at least one more time. It was awesome. Awesome. Um, cool. All right. So, uh Today, we want to talk about some of the work we've been doing, um, which relates to, uh, I guess, does it go back to our optimistic conversation? Um, I guess to set this up, we were talking about re-renders in Next.js. So um, we're talking about Next.js, we're talking about some new React features, and um, I'm trying to remember what kicked off this conversation with us. Was it the instant search params? Uh, no, I think we were talking about why layouts don't re-render. Right. In, in... Do you remember what we were trying to do that caused that? No. I, Maybe we were just talking yeah, about revalidation we're... and yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> in Next.js um, and server components, A lot of people have asked questions and there's been confusion around the caching story in Next. And um, in particular, if you have an action that the current user initiates, it needs to call something like revalidate path or revalidate tag as part of Next.js for the page to re-render. Otherwise, there's some default caching built in to the way that next caches pages that you've already visited that session. Beyond that, even setting all of that aside, there's also behavior in Next.js where, because Next now has the app directory we're talking about, now has this nested routing structure, kind of like React Router, like Remix, like Ember had back in the day. Parent layouts don't re-render when you navigate around child routes. And it relates to the caching conversation because you could click a link that's a child route navigation and um, you might not see an updated 
value in the parent layout. And you might wonder if it's because of caching, which again, a lot of people are running into just trying to understand that, or it's because the layout didn't re-render. So I think this was kind of how we started this conversation. We were thinking about doing it for Build UI or our admin page and how to teach this, how to make a demo about it. And so what's kind of like the right mental model for thinking about all these pieces working together? Um, also, it's it's worth noting that if you, a lot of people say like, why why don't layouts re-render? If I start clicking links around a PHP app, every single navigation is gonna be a full re-render of that app. So why don't layouts re-render? And if you, if you build this sort of app, like if you take like your website and you just build it as a React app, um, and you start clicking links in like, uh, imagine you have a layout component and a page component, and then there's a bunch of like, uh, you call set state inside that page component. So you start clicking things inside that page component. Your layout component isn't going to re-render. Like the parent components aren't gonna re-render. So it, it, it layout's not re-rendering. I, I do think there's this expectation that people have like, oh, it's a link. It should re-render, I'm going to a new page. But then there's also like this reactism where um, just because there's a state change in a child component doesn't mean the whole tree is going to re-render. Right. So I think that's one so, way yeah. to, to start to introduce yep. this, to start to think about this. Yep. This will be a bit more of a freeform conversation, this podcast. So, um, But I want to I wanna go through some of these tweets to kind of load this conversation up and um for like listeners so they can follow along because it's there's a lot of moving pieces here so there's the caching part we can set that aside there's the layouts not re-rendering and then um basically what you just said which is typically in websites you click around links and you always see a full page refresh so you're always seeing the freshest data so that's kind of just something to keep in mind but where we're going with this conversation is it kind of all comes down to like this push versus pull and solidifying this mental model around the fact that React and every other framework, uh, every other JavaScript framework is really a push-based system in the sense that the programmer decides when something should re-render. And on the flip side of that is actually the way game engines work, video game engines. And so I have some tweets here from Sebastian and then I was, I was t chatting with him. And game engines are the opposite you can think about where the state of the world is always there and the rendering engine updates the screen at 60 frames a second. And th therefore, there's no question of whether things are up to date in sync, whether there's a stale part of a data, like a notifications count here versus here, because every frame is being basically you can think of it as being created from scratch and it's reading from like the the state the application state every time and now there's uh there's techniques in video game engines that let you avoid unnecessary work i think culling is the term for when the viewport of the user the character is not like looking over here then you don't need to render the mountains over here you just need to render like the ocean in front of you or whatever but it's still the mental model that you're rendering 60 frames a second. And therefore, a lot of the problems we have as web developers, they don't have to think about that because it's just always getting the freshest data. So that's that's something else just to keep in mind as I kind of set this up. Um, so uh, one, uh, one example that we've thought about here is like the GitHub issues page. So let's take GitHub issues because that's like a concrete example we can start with that we're all familiar with. You have a repo and you have these tabs, code, you know, issues, discussions, activity or whatever. And it, let's say issues, the tab in, in the, the top of the page has like a count of how many close, how many open issues there are. It says 10. Now, if you click on issues and you close an issue in a Rails app, in a server rendered app that's fully server rendered, Closing an issue would give you a redirect, let's say back to the index page of issues and the issues count would go down by one. Now, to your point, let's say you were doing this in a React app and that tab navigation was in the parent. It was in like the layout and then you click close on an issue in a child route. 
if this was all client side React and all of this was just React state, set aside the server for a There's second. There's like no SWR in this situation. There's no There's data no entry. SWR. This is like a demo There's React nothing. app. Exactly. Then let's say that the parent layout has the unread issues count as some state or something. And then you have all the issues and then you toggle one to close. If you just toggle it to close, um, the parent layout wouldn't update. So then you're like, okay, well, what's the source of truth for the parents layout unread count? And maybe it's derived some, from something. So you hoist those issues up. And now if the source of truth that that React state sits above both of those layout and the child route and you update it, it will re-render. But if you just update something down below, the parent doesn't know to re-render, right? And so Sebastian was Not talking about this. Not even doesn't know. I'm, I'm going to get a little pedantic here, but it shouldn't. It's like part of like the, it it's an optimization that React can make where it says we don't, kind of like your video game example, we don't need to re-render this component because no state in this component changed. Exactly. Now, um, uh, Sebastian was talking about this on Twitter um, because when server actions were introduced, as a way to do mutations and trigger revalidations with these revalidate APIs, people were migrating apps that let's say used SWR in the client. So if you're using something on the client to make a post request, there's no way that your server component, which is now like a live, you know, it's like a server page generating, this is a server generating the UI. It doesn't know that you just fired an Ajax request. So conceptually, it's a similar kind of thing. If you click close issue on an issue and you just fire willy nilly like a fetch request to close it, how is your server going to know anything changed? It's just like the layout example. It shouldn't re-render. So server actions um, are a solution to this because they tie the mutation to what data needs to change, right? So that's, that's kind of how those two link together and how you would know maybe to refetch the data for an ancestor if an action down below called revalidate tag or revalidate path, right? At like a high level. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so that makes sense. But then if you look at something like navigation, which is like when I start with my demos, I'm always thinking about that. And we have the situation where layouts don't get maybe the search params. They don't get the full request, right? They just get, what do they get? They they will get um, headers. They can ask for headers. And what's the other thing? They can ask for like cookies. Cookies. Yep. Uh, I think that's it. And do they get params? Oh. But they but they don't get they don't get the path like the, the URL, Correct. the path name. Correct. So in, in Next.js, like the painting of your screen does not map to a single HTTP request because the layout could have been painted by one HTTP request and the inner parts by uh, HTTP requests after you've navigated. Right. So that's the analogy to the fully client side React app, which is the tree, right? And this is an ancestor thing and only state in the bottom has changed. But it's really confusing when you try to do something like your layout hat, let's say you're building you know, Apple Music and you have the list, a master detail view, right? A UI. And you have a list of all your artists and then you select an artist and it's like artist slash slug and that renders right here. So you would think the layout would fetch the artists and would render them all in the sidebar. And then when you click on it, it's a link to slash, you know, artist slug and that fills in the child route page. So master detail. But then how do you, uh, how do you know which artist is selected in the layout? Because you don't get the path name and so the layout can't choose which link to render as an active link. And so this was part of the conversation that started on Twitter. This was like in August of last year, it looks like. And it's like, why can't we get the full URL here? Because first of all, that would make this easy. But second of all, it feels conceptually like the URL is a prop to the whole app. It's the URL sits outside of your full app and therefore updates to it should basically re-render your whole app. Um, I, so I, I actually, I agree with, with this, 
but I, I will say that this is like, this is a framework level decision. And so Next.js does not like, does not believe this. And I, I don't think, by the way, I don't think they're wrong for not believing this. I think this is like a, um, it's like saying is a sports car, a minivan or an 18 wheeler truck truck better. Well, they all have their own different right. use cases. And, and so Next.js is optimizing for a certain use case and their use case is going to say that, uh, we do not want, we do not want th all these layouts to right. re render. Uh, we don't want them to have access to the URL because then they, then they, they have, have to re-render re on every, they have to re-render on every single right. navigation. So change. that's really what this conversation um, is about. Why did next make that decision and why don't they pass the request to every layout and every page? Um, and my first thought, so if we kind of walk through our conversation, it's like, that's hard to build, but setting that aside, why don't we just give the URL to everybody? And the response to that is basically, we don't want, you know, layouts to re-render and we can, we can, we can answer why that is in the future. Right. But if you want layouts to get access to those things you can build like client components that do it there's ways there's ways to avoid it but this led me to like a bigger question which is like this feels like it doesn't match the react model uh and this was my thinking you know last week so in react it's true what you said when you we started this conversation which is if there's state in a subtree and it, you update it, the parent's not going to re-render, right? It's also true that if you have state in a parent and you update it, you're going to render the entire tree, right? Re React is going to re-render the whole tree. It's going to do reconciliation and diffing, and then it's going to apply the diffs. And that's part of React's mental model as well, which is that if you have, you know, the current artist and it's like up here the fact that you're re-rendering all these other components even if there's components in some other subtree that don't really care about it you shouldn't really think about that part of the react mental model is that you do always re-render so that your ui is always in sync that was in fact part of the value proposition when react first came out it said instead of us having specific pieces of state that we update surgically what if we just re-rendered all the time? Then our UI would be in sync all the time. And so thinking about it from that perspective, and we're gonna get to why both of those are React, is a, they are part of React's philosophy, but thinking about it from that perspective, my thinking was, okay, the URL is like a prop to the whole app. And why don't we just re-render the whole app? And by default, always re-render feels like the most React way to do things. And if there's a situation where you want a layout not to re-render, maybe you're doing some animation or something like that. Someone changes the URL and you don't want it to re just re-render, you know? We have tools for opting out of re-renders. We already have tools in React for opting out of re-renders. For example, we have memo, uh, use memo and use callback. Use callback you can use so that a function isn't created every time you render. Use memo you can use so that a component isn't re-rendered unless certain props change. So it feels like the most React way to do things is start by default with always re-render so that your UI is always correct. There's no inconsistency. And then opt out of re-renders as opposed to opting in, right? You're opting out with things like these, these, these APIs like memo and callback. And... Um, you know, even even um, even uh, libraries like Framer Motion opt out of re-rendering for specific use cases. For example, they want to run an animation that runs at 60 frames a second. We don't want to re-render our React app at 60 frames a second. So they step outside of React rendering and then call back once they need to update. But it feels like in general, the rule should be always re-render and then we can opt out when we need it. So this is kind of what started this conversation. And um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think just to poke at this, like you're saying 
we should always we should always have the URL as a prop at like the top level, like the capital A app component always gets the URL and then it can feed it down through this through all the sub components. And if uh, any component wants to opt out when the URL doesn't change, they have the tools to do right. so. But that's a big assumption because you're you're making an assumption here that there's always a URL. And there's not always a URL. Like next can say we want to build these pages at build time. There's no request. There's no URL. Mm, that's a good point. And so and so th this is where I, this is where I think kind of like the sports car versus minivan versus 18 wheeler comes into play where they 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 are building a framework that that is going to let you render pages and build pages when there's no request. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then they give you the tools when you do actually need to read the request to kind of opt out of that. That's that, interesting. That. We didn't really talk about that last week, or at least I don't I don't remember it. But um, that's a great point. And uh, even still, I think we can take the harder case where we set that aside. Great, great point. Let's set that aside and, and still make the argument mm -hmm. for the Next.js perspective on this, which is you have a request time app that you're building. So again, Sam last week is saying, you call router.push, you know, router. or you click on a link. Next is starting a transition and it's suspending while the new page is being prepared. That means it's setting state somewhere. The router state is somewhere, it's being set. If you were building this yourself, you would have that like at the root because you're changing it and you're calling set state. So where is that state and why can't we see it? It's kind of like how I was thinking about it, right? And um, so the question is, how, isn't this idea of, saying, you know what, this kind of global-ish state, which the URL feels like global state, it, you don't think so? <laughs> not, in, well, not in Next.js, no. No, I mean, I mean, I, I, I like. Let's just go, let's I just go, let's go with this argument. So, okay, okay, so the URL is global state, let's say. And so every component would slash should need it. If we were building a framework, it's totally reasonable for anyone to want to be able to read the URL either on the server or the client. I mean, even in the pages directory apps that we've done, there's a lot of times where you don't get, for example, the search params and it's very confusing. And that's because we wanted to do something at build time. Setting that aside, let's just make a framework that doesn't have build time features that only runs at request and response time. And you can always get the request that was used because that's a reasonable mm -hmm. thing that you'd want to expose as a value, let's yes. say. So, <clears throat> okay, we're in that world. Um, isn't that the most React thing to do? This thing that is global uh, should be available and it sh we should re-render everything all the time. So, um, and then people can... I might, my answer here would be yes. I mean, if, yeah, yes, like a hundred percent. So see this, see, yes, see, if you're building a request response. Yeah, yeah, but this is where, this is where this, the I mean, this conversation is where I disagree. was interesting. Um, because it, this is where like, I would disagree with the, the next, not the next year's philosophy, but this is where I would say like, you're buying a sports car and, and you have a family with three screaming, uh, toddlers. You, you need to be in a minivan, right. my friend. That's. So but you let, and I, but let's, you, let's, you and I are let's building. withhold the, the judgment okay, okay. about which value and which approach is more suitable. Let's just try to explain because it's not about. I feel like I feel like you have something that you uh, yes. point you want to get to. That yes, I'm yes, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Why don't you just because go there? Okay. The next team and Sebastian wouldn't be arguing that this is better for making certain kind of sites if it was less reacty, right? If if it's if my criticism is true that this is not this is not as reacty it doesn't embrace the paradigm as well or it it like is actually against the paradigm because the par what's important about the paradigm is that it always re-renders and this doesn't do that then that that wouldn't fly right so what i'm going to get to is there's a reason why it still embraces the paradigm it's, it still is fully react in spirit whereas i was thinking it wasn't because of the fact that memo and callback are ways to opt out of re-render whereas this feels like app developers have to opt into re-render if that makes sense so yeah keep, yeah keep so up, i'll keep, keep going up. so okay so this is kind of the setup and it's like why don't we basically the simple way to say everything i just said is why don't layouts just get the request 
So Sebastian said on Twitter, there's a variant here which always refetches everything on any network change or nav or focus, where you never have to invalidate anything. That wouldn't scale up, but is a valid approach. Don't think we'd do that. And um, I said, I actually was in this conversation. I said it, it could be an option. It could be helpful if this was an option. Start with always fresh pages. If it works for Rails, it should be okay for Next. He said, it's really a whole other framework. You can't expect to import a library or component and expect it to work. Could be assuming caching to be efficient or assuming it doesn't need to invalidate. Should be a different brand. Um, and then someone was like, why can't we add a config to this for Next? Why can't I just globally run my Next app in a way that is always fresh on every navigation and focus, something like that, something like SWR does. He says, Next has the same lever to refresh and push, but it's about configuring it globally that creates a problem. Config is the enemy of composability. Composability builds ecosystems. Configs are one of the worst things you can add to a framework, at least global ones. Um, and then Fred said, why are global configs bad? Uh, Dan said, if there's a global config, it means the same code will work differently inside different apps, even if they use the same framework and even version. This means you can't build reusable packages that work for everyone. This is why the ecosystem doesn't get built. So um, we were talking about this. And again, going back to my perspective of like, we should default to always re-rendering because that is more React. That is, that is the React mentality. And... Um, this is where my conversation I, with Sebastian can, went into the push versus pull and the immediate mode GUIs and the video game engine stuff, which I think is is interesting. Okay, before we go there, can I yeah. try to convince you that 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 is not always re-rendering? Because I think that's like a key like a key point. So what you said something like it should be top down. It should basically always be. if you buy the premise that the URL the request is state that is in the root app component then every time yep. it updates, the whole tree should re-render. Okay, but I think I think I want to convince you that like that that, that doesn't, premise isn't true and you don't and and you don't actually okay. believe that. That's okay. that's 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 a, the, the trick here. You have imagine you have a tree that's layout one, layout two, and then page. So there's three levels of nesting. Three levels okay. of nesting, yes. Layout one the top level is just like your HTML tag, your CSS, so it like includes Tailwind, your Google Analytics, all that. And then it renders children. And then you have layout two, which is gonna be like kind of like your admin level layout. Let's, I'm just kind of mm -hmm. running with something here, but like you have mm -hmm. nav links. So you have like selected nav link, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And um, then underneath layout two, you're gonna have your page. So that's gonna be- And that's like gonna be children in layout page one, in layout two, yeah. Yes, and that's and then layout, yes, layout, the middle layout, layout two returns children. And then you have your page, okay? So the selected nav, and the, and, and in this, there's no server in this right. case, we're just like writing like a demo code right. sandbox uh, React app. When you navigate from, let's say settings to about, mm -hmm. or settings to profile or whatever, you are changing the state inside that component that has a nav bar. So that's layout yeah. two, not layout one. And then so you're you like you have like a page that has a link. You click that link, it calls some function that was passed into it from layout one. Layout one updates its state and re-renders. And at that point, you don't you you as a React developer would not say my whole app should re-render. You as a React developer, you would you wouldn't say like my the the thing that's rendering my Tailwind script tag and and um, like that HTML opening tag and and all that stuff that shouldn't re-render because that that had no state up. But let in this that, I, I I agree with with this with the setup you made. Let's just for sake of again make taking the hardest case because I think the hardest case explains what he kind of got what we got around to in our conversation too. Um, let's say the root. Like in this this framework that you're doing, you know mm -hmm. how you can you call React DOM dot render root whatever you call to render to actually mount the application, and you can re-render app like in the JavaScript. App is a component that takes in props of like the current request or the URL. Let's say. 
I, 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 yeah, I know. This is where I think you're making the jump. But, though, let, but you can assume saying, that you can also say that could be a reasonable way to build a framework. But you could also say like conceptually, it is an input into the whole app because the app is really a materialized view of the URL. Like the URL is being used to choose which components to render, which layouts to render. It's, it, it, it is an input. You know what I'm saying? I, I will. Yeah, I, I, that, I think this is where our, you yeah. keep going. I think this is okay, where our gotcha. disagreement So is. let's, let's just, let's just yeah. assume that for now and say, okay, even still, like this is an, an input and, um, and maybe this is part of what you, you're saying, which is that I'm saying the URL, my argument here s sitting on the debate stage or whatever is like talking to Sebastian or, you know, the next designers is like the URL is an input to the whole app. And if it changes, we should just re-render. And if your argument, if your counter is that that won't let you scale up because there's too many re-renders, well, we have tools to avoid re-renders in React. And nobody ever said React shouldn't always re-render uh, because it doesn't scale. That's why we, because for the most part, it does. It works. It's fast enough. That was the insight with reconciliation, the virtual DOM, and that whole f render phase, which lets us do this so that we have an accurate tree. Um, and then for the, the small min minority of cases where we need to avoid re-rendering, we have these tools. So why not just make it easier to do things accurately, provide the URL to every component in the tree, re-render the whole tree when the URL changes, and let people opt out when they need to. So this is where this conversation of immediate mode GUIs comes in. Because if you squint a little bit, we're saying, okay, every time the URL changes, re-render. Every time you hit back or forward, re-render. Every time you focus the browser, re-render. Always re-render all the time in a way that re-render when the user is interested in, in something changing or expects something to change. Let's just always re-render. So then it's like, What's the logical conclusion of that? Re-render every 60 times a second. The amount of times a human can view updates in a digital device, right? This is kind of where he talks about this explicit versus implicit updating. If you could just update 60 frames a second, let's remove network latency. Let's remove all this stuff. You have a client side app and there's no lag. There's no computation power. If you could re-render 60 frames a second, you wouldn't have to think about any of this stuff at all because an interaction would update some state and everything in your UI would re-render at 60 frames a second, right? Now, now if you add latency, let's say that you have server components, you have something that goes across the network and the speed of light is a constraint, your server and the network is a constraint. So let's say the fastest, let's say you turned on always re-render, right? This was like our conversation about like set interval router.refresh every, you know, 100 milliseconds. Let's say you could do it four times a second, every 250 milliseconds. So every 250 milliseconds, you just drop a, a loop in your app that re-renders it. Wouldn't that solve these problems? If I've clicked a link within the last 250 milliseconds, I'm going to see the latest version of it in the lat layout, in the head, in everything. Um, that works for a lot of interactions, actually. You, you could build an, an app that updates four times a second and you wouldn't have to, the developer would never have to think about stale values anywhere for a lot of interactions, mm -hmm. but it adds a ceiling to what you can do in the UI. So if you start dragging a Trello card, if you really, again, take this to the logical conclusion, I've clicked on a card and my mouse coordinates are here. Now I have to go to the server and get the new um, UI. Now you can only move that Trello card four times a second, and it's going to be really choppy, right? So the latency and the lag is what makes this idea of immediate mode GUIs um, not feasible. And if you take it to kind of all the way up to how we build websites, the fact that you're looking at a screen and not doing anything, and it's not re-rendering, not only is it part of the expectation for how it works, um, but it really solidifies this idea that whether we're using React or something else, 
it's a push based system. You have to push updates instead explicitly and you choose when you re-render as opposed to implicitly reading some global state all the time, right? Um, mm -hmm. If you could only re-render four times a second, you can't build Trello. Does that make sense? Yes. And so the always re-rendering due to the network latency puts a limit on what you can build. So in the same way, always re-rendering on navigation or back forward clicks puts a limit, puts a similar constraint. What, what, what are you smiling about? Uh, it's completely wrong. Wait, why? <laughs> Sorry, that was too. That was me. I, I agree. So I think this is. I think you're just you're making too big of a jump here. I think yes, you cannot. We like like imagine a world where you could call you just like ran a loop like while yeah. true yeah re render and there was no no yeah. latency like all your data from the database would just yep. come like just instantly paint on the screen. There was no no physics, no speed of light. Like that would be awesome yep. for us for for building yep. applications. Like it would be it would be instant fast. But I don't like it, and then and then you start to slow that down. So you you've got like a little you're like God. You've got like a little slider, and like as Sam and Ryan are building apps, you 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 add start adding yes. latency. So maybe at like one millisecond latency, it's still fine for us. Sixteen milliseconds, it's still fine. But we're like, hey, wait, is something going on? And then you drag that slider up to a certain number. Let's say you, your example is two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty, man, it is. It is noticeable. Now, all of a sudden, we're dragging a Trello card, and on every mouse move, we call set state to like mouse yep. coordinates. But that state doesn't re render now for 250 milliseconds. And so, it's like, like trying yeah, to play Counter Strike at, and at you four would, frames a second. You wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just got taken back. <laughs> <Counter> -Strike, so. <laughs> um, okay. So, so. So yeah, it that like we we this is why we can't build um what you what you call them immediate immediate, immediate you can't mode. use immediate mode GUIs. rendering the way GUIs are done in game engines because of network latency. Let's just say that's the reason why. Right. Right. And when you talk to web developers about this, they they don't even like entertain right. this fact, right? Cuz they're like, yeah, I have like a database and I have web servers and I you know what I mean? Just like this the, You know what's funny is that up, just a, like, a little a, a side note, the, the Phoenix Live View people are basically thinking in this way. But um anyways, carry on. Yeah. Yes, that's yes, that is true. People mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Um I agree that that is true, but I do not think that you can come to the conclusion that therefore uh, we can't re-render, we can't repaint. Okay, you don't have to come to that conclusion, it, but stay with me that if if you buy the premises that we've set up, the four frames a second puts a ceiling on what you can build. So you can't build Trello anymore. In the same way, it, it also follows then that always re-rendering on navigation forward and back, you can, it, it can, it can't, it, puts a ceiling on what you can build because because it's closer it's closer to always re-render um that's so, right that's well, right well, well, this is, I, like i, I don't this I'm, is yeah. again i want to disentangle the opinion about which value is the right fit for what you're building versus if this is a coherent logical thing Correct. and the reason i think it's it it you can agree with the argument here is because um so he he said um i said so we took that to web apps realized always re-render on navigation pose a similar constraint which could restrict which interactions you can support so the argument for the next JS architecture is default to doing the minimum amount of work for a given update give devs tools that let them opt into more updates as they see fit and he said yeah I think the key thing is that if you start at one end, you can opt into the other, but the reverse doesn't work. There's no migration path from implicit to explicit. So again, by implicit, he's talking about the 60 frames a second. You're implicitly reading. Explicit is how we do it in React and every framework where you push updates. And um, if you, so yeah, so, so, so take, so just again, setting aside the opinion more about the coherent, is it true? Mm -hmm. If you were to start with something that always re-rendered, always gave the response, it, you can't really opt out of that. 
is kind of what he's saying. Because you, because, because back to your example, if you set state in the parent, you do re-render everything. And yes, you can opt out of re-renders with like memo and callback, but it's not airtight. It's like, you have to be careful. Maybe you wrote a component and then now somebody does something that causes it to re-render every time on every nav. And that, that's it. That's, that's the issue, issue. That's right? Um, um, and this, I, again, this is where I think the trap is is I think it's, it's, you can say that like, if you never ever re-render and I give you the tools to re-render, there is no seal right. on your application. Verse, verse, if you start at the other end. Right. Like I, I, I completely agree with that. If you start over here and we're not gonna re-render all your layouts, we're not gonna re-render mm -hmm. your site on every navigation, and but but if you need to, hey, we're going to give you the tools right. to do that. I do agree that you can build, you can build anything, and it 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 scales. Verse starting at the other end, we're always going to re-render. Now you're in this this you you know maybe it starts out it's really easy to build a website. You're always re-rendering, but then now I don't know someone adds something, they start changing links really quickly, and now your header layout's just constantly updating. And now you have to think through that, like you have to think through that. Again, back to like the example I gave with like layout, layout, mm -hmm. page. In React, you don't have to think about that. That's the beauty. In React, you never have to think about that. Only the components where state mm -hmm. change happens, re-render happens. But man, I don't know. This is where like, I, I, I often think if, if, are we like taking this too far? Are we taking this, this philosophy too far here? And like, you can build a React app that their state that sits at the stop top of app and that state just always gets put in. You know, think of like, um, before I even go, I don't think we would say that's wrong. We might right. say there's like, we might say like, well, the app doesn't need this state. So, so put it like, move it down in the tree. The, the root level component doesn't right. need the state. So move it down. But I, I like, to me, it sounds like a, it, to me, trying to tell app developers who are building web apps that they need this optimization. So that, that I, I agree it, that it feels, and again, this, we're dipping our toes into the value judgment and from, from the normative to the positive part of this. But I, but I agree that, um, that is, uh, that's hard to swallow that. It feels more like th if, if this is the point that the next JS philosophy is to uh, default to the, doing the minimum amount of work for a given update and give the exposed APIs that let you opt into more updates, you could build a Ruby on Rails on top of Next, right? That that made those that yeah. made those um, opinions baked in, re-rendered everything because the kind of app you're building, it's okay for it to always re-render on every navigation, right? So right, right, yeah, right. There's nothing, there's nothing in next that, li that yes. limits. It. Next is not e exactly, yes. and this is whereas if you started with, if if next if if you started with something that always re render, then you hit the four frames a second Trello thing. Oh shoot, this thing is updating four frames a second. Now I can't drag a card. Right, that it's just an analogy. It's just an analogy because of. I know, but can't uh, this? I don't. I don't like this analogy because can't. Can't I tell you that you are wrong for using JavaScript because there are certain apps that you don't maybe wrong maybe you're trying and again you're trying to disentangle yeah. like yes. why it is for yes. like the value yes. Yes. so so can't you say like like doesn't this doesn't like I again maybe I'm jumping too if far if you're jumping that, to so the app developer stop, but, no it's fine the the app de no but like why even like like can't someone come along and say like you shouldn't use JavaScript because it puts the JavaScript has these features that put a ceiling on the type of app you can build. And sure, by the sure, way, I'm sure. not saying that like that Next.js or anyone. No, 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 I follow. Ryan I follow. making this argument. I guess like, the I guess the response to what you're isn't saying isn't there a point where it's like the ceiling? There, there is always going to be a but that's ceiling. The, that's the question. Like I picked the. That, I mean, that's the question. It's like it, it, it's you know back when we did Ember and they talked about using the right tool for the job, and then they added the server side rendering. And Tom talked about like bending the trade-off curve, like literally bending the curve, you know, and that was a good thing because it mm -hmm. made it applicable to more situations than what it was before that. 
So I think that's, again, it's an intellectual exercise of what, if Next is trying to get in a position where it applies to the most kinds of web app, websites and web apps possible, and again, tying it back to the conversation at the beginning, because when I first read the whole thing about global config as an enemy of ecosystems and what Dan was saying about a component working differently in your next app than my next app, then it starts to make sense uh, just to, again, describing what the goal here is for them. Do the least amount of work possible and make it so that you can't have a next app that's going to cause a parent layout to re-render and therefore you can use you can use more stuff if that's true and if they're trying to create an ecosystem that can apply to a wider range you can just you know you can see whereas if you had uh, i don't yeah okay i think the argument here is like i install i don't know tweak component or i install some third yes. party library tweak component. component is a good example and and i render it in my root layout and it it i don't know it, it makes um, a data request and it, it's like a blocking data request it has or something. to do, yeah it has to do all yeah. this work and then i start changing stuff in a sub something mm -hmm. further down in the tree that component doesn't have to right. re-render because uh, the stuff low down in the tree but if, if I, we were using our framework example, that re-rendered every navigation where url yep. Now that thing has yep. to re-render. But all all I hear when you say this is th a framework that gets URL is is not viable because it doesn't compose. Not 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 viable. Components. It's just not as it it it. I, and again, and this is where this is where this is where it just kind of untangle my thought. This is where like the um. It's like you developer should not have access to the URL because it enables a tweak component that you'll be able to use in the ecosystem. That's like their perspective. Let's let's just say, let's just say yes, yeah yeah yes. yes yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Whereas if you were if you were using you know Sam and Ryan framework, don't set aside updating on set dude, set dude, aside. It's not we're not dude SWR. Yes. This is how SWR yeah. works. I mean, it's not like we're not we're not going out. No, on I know it's it's just libraries right. that work like it's this. just it's it's just um if you're using a framework that were set aside updating every time you click a link or back and forth let's just update four times a second just all the time you can understand why there'd be a lot of components in the react ecosystem that would be hard to use that would that would not work yes you know and again taking the logical conclusion let's re-render our react app 60 frames a second there's a ton of components uh even if they were correct that uh, wouldn't function. It would be performance would be restrictive there, and re-rendering your app sixty times a second right. wouldn't work. Um, so that's 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 given that that's the setup. Then you can understand again, just coherent, just a, a, a I guess po was it positive and normative ones opinions, ones like like the scientific analysis we're doing, trying to do the positive, positive. So I know, but so, I want to. So, I want to. So if, if you're taking the, you're trying to charitably explain the, the positive argument here you would want to do the least amount of work because that enables the most amount of components and you wouldn't want to expose a global config that allowed certain next apps to globally opt in to more re-rendering than the base level typically does um because then it, it, it ensures the components were and again i was just trying to understand the same way that, and when you say when you say global config just like let's take that to the conclusion a global config that re-renders your app Exactly. Times a second. Exactly. Yeah. So it was worth. Anyway, I wanted to talk about that because it was helpful for me. Yeah, to yeah, understand. yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't understand those points when we first read them, and then when we talked about them, um, and then you know maybe we can have now or another episode where we talk about what we think is it, whether it's wise for people to do this to use this sort of framework for building X type of app or Y type of app, right? Because that's the separate question, which is okay, given. Given that this is the this is the mental model, this is a philosophy of Next.js. Um, now, mm -hmm. is it correct to use it for Project X or Project Y? Right. Just like it's helpful to understand DHH's uh, uh, philosophy and the Rails philosophy, and then you can make a decision: Is it useful for building, you know, a Figma? Okay, probably not going to help you out a lot there. 
right? So I, I, that's, that, that was my mental exercise with this, was trying to have a deeper understanding of the philosophy of Next um, because it helps elucidate why there are certain decisions like layouts not getting access to the URL, like the, you know, the, the layouts not being re-rendered when you navigate to the children, um, and even some of the caching stuff that's been you know, pretty confusing for the community, I think. Uh, I think it helps to understand the philosophy and the perspective. And, and then that, once you, have, once you have a better understanding of that philosophy, not only does it help you understand the, the, how to best use the framework and why the, it is the way it is, it also helps you evaluate whether it's the right tool for your job, right? And that, that's kind of what right, you've been talking right. about. I will say before, so, so <laughs> I may have sounded like against this idea or against next. I, 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 I want to make it clear that like with next, they have these opinions, but you can build, yes. you said earlier, you can build like Ruby on Rails yes. on next. So there, it doesn't, the fact that next doesn't re-render layouts doesn't mean they can't have an active class name in your layout layouts for the, for the segment yeah, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Like in the, in, in the, in the Apple yeah, music you can, example, any, anything, right, right. You can Apple music example, because the layout doesn't re-render in next doesn't mean you can't build to build that. It just means you're going to have to build your own abstractions. On exactly. Top of next. And, and always use. Them. And then so the I question think, is, is I it think, worth you investing in doing that? Or is it worth using a tool that is, you know, for a given team, for a given project to understand that this is the, the worldview of next and therefore to get something that's going to make you feel productive when you're doing this sort of thing, you're going to have to, you know, build on top of it, some abstractions that work. Um, that's the separate question, right? But, um, Again, it's 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 nice to understand, you know, that that's where that that's why that's why it is the way it is. And also, if you are building abstractions, for example, you know, a link that decorates its active class or not, or a layout that knows what the path name is, and you know, um, you want to do those things in a way that doesn't feel like framework fighting. That's the other part about this that's kind of confusing, right? Because you mm -hmm. see things like the layout doesn't re-render and then you try to build a master detail list and it's hard to do out of the box. It's confusing how to do it, like out of the box. Whereas like a framework like Rails or something, or, you know, it, it would be a lot easier. A remix would be a lot easier because you just get the request. So then you start trying to work around these design decisions. You work, you try, you're, you feel like you're working around the fact that layouts don't re-render or they don't get the URL. And that doesn't feel good either because it feels like you're framework fighting. I think instead, it's what you said. First, you understand why these decisions are the way they are. Then you can build abstractions on top that opt into more re-renders because that's what you desire in this part of your app. But you know, you're, it's not that you're framework fighting anymore because you're not working around it. You're, you're building these parts on top of it for your page or your sub page. And then maybe eventually there's, you can add something that wants to do something more intense or, you know, it doesn't want to re-render and you'll be able to do that. That's kind of like the philosophy. And you're not you're constrained. Not constrained. You're right. You're, you're right. You're not constrained. By exactly. Um, and then again, the, the follow-up question is whether that's the right decision for a team to do that. But, but that's a separate right, conversation. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, I do think it's, I mean, again, I, it's, we can, I think it, if we want to end with an opinion, I, I think both of us agree. I, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm not commenting about whether this is good for a framework to do or bad. It would be like, I'm, that, that's not what I'm, that's not what the point of this conversation for me. But I do think that if a framework, this is an opinion I have, which is if a framework is going to take this perspective, that we are going to be doing the least amount of work that is reasonable, that's possible to do the sorts of things people want to do. But that's going to lead to situations where things don't re-render where you would expect them to, like clicking a link or something like that. If that's the perspective we're going to take and we're marketing ourselves as a framework for app developers, we should be clear about that. And app developers should understand that that is a, like a trade-off that we've made as a design decision. 
and therefore and call those things out. And I think I think that goes to some of the frustration that we've seen with the release of the app directory, the caching behavior, the layouts not getting the URL. You can find a million questions about this, and you, but you don't find a guide in the, in the docs that talk about this stuff. You can find it if you can suss it out and talk about it. But I think there's a clear way to to explain it. And therefore, again, people can make their own decisions about, okay, maybe this is not for me, but at least I understand why. And yeah, so that's, I, I think because it really, you've said this before, next just kind of feels like a power saw, you know what I mean? And, and after this conversation, it's like, yeah, the whole point is like, it's a framework. It's a framework. For right. Building it, it, it can feel I mean, like that. that, that yes. Is, yes. I mean, it, it, you could argue it is because every, every next app will end up having a link that has an active class, but that's something that they built themselves. You know, you can't, you can't, let's just say, I think this is a good one to say, you can't build a framework for building next JS because if you did, you'd build yeah, next.js. Yeah, exactly. Right. But you can build any yes. other framework yep. like yep. remix rails. Yep. You can all, you can build has all those fewer opinions. Next yes. JS. And that, Next.js yeah. is like the lowest <laughs> level of <laughs> yeah. framework. I don't no, know. No, no, I, I think that may it's a, fr I, I like, I always like the react as a, a programming for language UIs. for building UIs. It's not like a right. component library. It's a right. programming language for building. Next.js is a programming language Next for a fr building frameworks, <laughs> building frameworks. <laughs> that, you know, I just thought about the other example, because one demo I was working on this week was, um, the URL getting the, the upcoming URL, um, to other nav links in the application. And, you know, next has a router and why doesn't it have router events? People have asked this, you know, in remix, you can use navigation, use navigation dot location tells you the upcoming location. It's a global thing, right? We're building a router. Mm -hmm. You clicked on a link. The user is only ever going one, one place at a given time. Shouldn't the framework expose that? So why doesn't next routers expose router events, right? Why doesn't they, why don't they tell you? It's funny, if you put console log and use path name as a hook, this came up in my search params um, post too. Use path name as a client side hook. You'd expect it to update immediately. Just like in next 12, you click a link, the URL updates, and then you fetch the page. Why doesn't it update? Well, now we block on the server, our server round trip. But if you put console log in path name, you're gonna see the new path name immediately. It's because it's, the version of your app that's being rendered in a transition. It's in another universe. It's not accessible, the first one. So so you say, well, wh why the heck doesn't next router emit events when it changes so I can see this stuff? Because I want to show like uh, an activating state on a link when I'm clicking on it. And I want a deactivating state on a previous link. And for that, I need to know what the upcoming URL is. Well, what would happen if they exposed, uh, let's say that they exposed router events globally. Now you can build something that uses like end progress. You say use effect in your root app on router change, render an end progress bar. It's like that progress that goes on the top of your website. And every time you click a link, just using next link, because now you've hooked into next router's events, you're going to show that progress bar. And now someone comes and builds a little messenger widget at the bottom of your screen and like messages on Twitter that's embedded in the homepage and they start clicking around different inboxes and they happen to use next link because they wanna change, they want those tied to the URL. So if you refresh, you, you stay on like my conversation with Ryan, but it's a little widget, it's a little component. They click on it and now the- It has its clear it's own, own UI, it has it's, own box. It's a component, it should be encapsulated where in React land, we shouldn't have spooky action at a distance, but now you click on Ryan and you see a global bar going across Far so top, yeah, this yeah. is the yep. same it's the same it's all part of the next js philosophy which is that sort of thing shouldn't happen and us as a framework is going to do the least amount possible to allow the most amount of you know possible shared components or ecosystem or however you want to say it the most kind of ui has to be built and then but you know you can sure as heck believe like if we were building something and we wanted to show that we would just have a link that's built on top of next link that does that sort of thing. Or like in my demo, I have a link that's built on top of next link that uses optimistic to 
update the URL to a global store that other optimistic links can read from. But those are optimistic links and no one could ever come in and add a next link that m messes with any of that stuff. So I thought it helped exp Yeah. I, I, okay. Yeah. You, I was just gonna yeah. say, I thought it helped explain a lot of these decisions. Um, it's good to know the why. And again, it's not about whether it's the yeah. right decision or not. It's just why wouldn't they expose this? If I was building a library, it's like I would expose this. But these are the kinds of things that they're thinking about. These are the kinds of things that they, they want to avoid or the problems they want to avoid. Again, whether those problems are relevant to you or not is a separate question. I feel like a lot of this stuff and even this podcast gets, there's like a game of telephone that gets played. So we say things like it puts a ceiling on your application you can't do these things and then i think people oh so i should use Next.js because because it's not going to limit me that is the wrong conclusion to feel, draw i feel like the but i but i feel like this is what what yeah. happens we're going to do like when we say things like and by the way i don't think nothing you said was sure. wrong like i obviously we've had this sure. conversation i agree with everything you're saying um but there there's this 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 telephone that gets played it's other frameworks are inefficient or you can don't anything you can build in the other framework you can build with, with that's, a JS, that's a different that's a different like, that's a different that's different than what we've said right but yes it can, it's, it's it's easy to I, see how you yeah, jump but do, from I, what we've said to that is what you're saying yeah and i i do feel like someone has to like there you just have to like someone needs to speak up for the user i mean i i feel like this yeah. is Everything you're saying is right, but it is like app developers should not be using a framework that has those principles to be building web apps. And that's like a, and, and, the, and the problem is as soon as we move it towards like composability or performance, I can't win any, any sure. argument. No, I, I, I hear you. It. And I think it's totally valid. I mean, to me, this is, this is like, this is why, you know, this is, this is the job of like experienced developers and develop and t engineering managers they're going to read marketing copy or see conference talks when react comes out and talk about everything it can enable and point out the things that you can do with it that you can't with rails but your job as an engineer as a programmer that tool you know is choosing the right tool for the job and People have been telling DHH that Rails is bad for building modern experiences for 10 years, and his yeah. opinion hasn't changed. And if you're building, you know, a base camp or something, uh, it's up to you to decide because Rails is basically in this area where it can only re-render it can only update let's say a pure server rendered app. let's just take the again the logical extreme for the sake of the conversation you only use server rendered ui you only use links and forms to do navigations you don't use any javascript yeah it puts a ceiling and um on what you can do but if you're the person making the choice it, it it's a cost and benefit thing so there's a ceiling does the ceiling even matter to me at all you know that's 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 something that that programmers have to have to learn with experience and if the cost is like a hundredth of the cost then again that's that's where like the bit like the decision making from the economics of it all come into play um and again that wasn't my goal with this conversation i, I think but I, I to your point um i think it comes it's I important think when you and i have these conversations it comes off and in, in not only to other listeners, but even to me, where I'm like, oh yeah, we should. No, be that's using not what. That's not the conclusion. <laughs> you can build anything. I mean, in shoot. That's JS. I know, but when we had this conversation last week. That's that's not like, how oh, I yeah, feel at like, all. I'm trying to understand it because so many people do use Next, and I want to be able to explain the why for these things. But, uh, dude, you know what you can build with more than Next? Canvas. Make your whole app in Canvas. I mean, you know what I'm saying. But I would never recommend anyone to do that. But if I was talking about it, you could still talk about Canvas as a way of what it can do with rendering that you can't with HTML and CSS, but that doesn't mean you should use it. <laughs> I know, but I guess, I and guess. And I'm not trying to slip that in we say, anywhere. I know, but when we say things like use Canvas or, 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 or update your site at 60 frames a second, everyone knows there's like, there's like, we're not being yeah. serious. We're like, we're like testing. Yeah, it's an idea. Yeah, almost. it's just like a, it's like a, you're thought testing experiment. Extreme. It's a thought like experiment. You're like, 
Right, you're right. You're yeah. trying to push up against something. Yeah, thought experiment. With like the, oh, use next because it can build anything. I, but I've never said feels that. Feels less. I've never said that. And if that and if that okay. came, acro and okay, if that came across, right. then then that's my fault because I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I'm not. I'm not. Again, the goal here is not to comment on whether I think it's correct or a suitable or a wise decision for next to go this way. I'm trying to understand why they made these decisions. So this is why. Um, and uh, the question about whether it's the right tool. Yeah, again, you can build anything with Canvas. Doesn't mean you should. Um, and if like, yeah, Rails and uh, is a much more mature framework and ecosystem. There's lots of reasons why people choose frameworks. It has something to do with what they're capable of as compared to what they're building. It also has to do with their preferences. We like writing JavaScript, so we usually use JavaScript frameworks for things. Um, but if I if it's come off that I said that the reason I'm explaining all this is that therefore use Next because it, no, that's that that's not the intention at all. Um, I, I like Next a lot. We, there's well, a lot we love about Next, um, but there's a lot that's yeah. really frustrating and hard. And 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 there's a lot, especially with the last year or two, with all all the changes. Um, there's a lot of these decisions that have caused a lot of struggle and and challenge for people. Um, so again, my my the the what I'm trying to do, my attempt here is to explain the reasoning behind them as to whether. It's not to defend the decisions and it's not to say that people should continue doing that or that they should make their own framework on next or right because it might not be right for them i would have to talk to somebody um but i've talked to plenty of people and not recommended them to use next plenty of people because it's mm -hmm. not it's not the right fit for them but it depends on who you are what your values are what you're building who your team is so um i definitely do not believe that uh because next has made the decision to to shoot for as wide an ecosystem as possible and to raise the ceiling as high as it can. Therefore, everyone should use it for every web app or anything like that. That yeah, I, I definitely don't believe that. I think I think but, yeah, but I don't to know take, how to But to take your point, I also can I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that when you're talking about the design decisions for something and you know, we're talking about it on a podcast, people can say, "Oh, therefore, um, yeah, that's what they're talking about, that's what they're teaching." And, um, I should use it because I'm going to like feel FOMO or whatever, or I'm going to feel like I'm missing out on this thing that enables all these new things. Right. Um, so yeah, let's, I mean, let's take a concrete example. It's the composability mm -hmm. thing with, with the ecosystem, um, like the, the tweet, tweet component. component. Yeah. 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 It probably doesn't matter for a lot of people today. Uh, I don't know how to, here, I, you can help me correct this because, but it, it feels bad to pick a framework knowing that it is not maximally it's not composable oh i don't agree like, with that at all with with other react components out there um i mean that feels like that that feels like a non-starter like to, to me like that feel like yeah oh hey because your component because your framework let's do the url example because your framework re-renders top down with the url um, there, there is this whole class of, of ecosystem components uh, that you won't be able to use. And this, I think this They'll, is why I was having such interesting. a reaction. So that was, that was the connection you made. There's, there's going to be a radix of be, in five years from now that you're not going to be able to use. Exactly. That you can't yeah. use. I, I don't think that because, because that, 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 yeah, because you're using a framework that re-renders yes. top down and, and, and not only that, but it's like, again, this is where I feel like where the. The lines get blurry. As soon as someone brings up composition, you can't. It's someone can say, "Okay, but your framework doesn't." Yeah, but that's not what I'm trying to do. Of, See, I don't, I don't, I don't agree. That's at least that's not my reaction. Um, By the way, I'm not saying that's where no, you went, but that's that that is a hundred percent where I went. Like a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I think I think that's fine. And I'm if your if your brain is going there, then a lot of people's are um, for sure. It's totally that's. I think. Um, we should be able to talk about the benefits in a way that doesn't connect directly to those. So yes, Ryan Florence had this tweet that talked about composability as one of React's root principles, root values. And if you're wondering why they made a decision for something, 
it probably the answer is probably composition. It's like saying Jesus yeah. in Sunday school. You really can't go wrong <laughs> if you fell asleep while your Bible study leader was asking a question. You just say Jesus and you're going to be right like 99% of the time. <laughs> so uh, react, the, 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 the Jesus answer is composition. That's why they don't use signals. That's why they don't do this or that, right? Whether composition is a, something that is important to you is a separate question. And people have to understand that there's lots of different values. I mean, composition is traded off when you use signals, yes. But what's the benefit like of using something like you know, or as felt or something. There's a lot of benefits. It's a lot easier to do a lot of things. It's very, very easy. Um, composability has a cost. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. an inherent good. And therefore, the more composable something is, the better. All else equal, that might be true. Composability is something we desire. So all else equal, if tool X is more composable than tool Y, then sure, you can make a statement that you should choose X, but all else is never equal, right? So um, in that same vein here, next is going for maximum ecosystem, composability, flexibility, growth, you know, shared code across next apps. And for that, they have to do the minimum amount of work by default for that to happen. Whether that's something that's valuable, all else equal, an ecosystem that can support more React components in the future than less is, is better. But again, all else is not equal. My take on this right now, and we can do an opinions episode, but my take right now is that next, these decisions and next, just like RSCs, are forward looking and they are aspirational towards a future that does have lots of things built on top of it that work. But today that's not true. So just like today, if you were gonna use RSCs, it's gonna be hard to do things that it's easy to do in Laravel or Rails. But maybe in five years, it will be easier and you'll be able to do more things. There will be more things. You'll have something like a Radix, right, library. That's like this headless thing. That's so easy to make a dialogue and a slide over compared to what we did 10, it's like, it's, it's so easy for us to forget, yeah. but those are the things that use portal, use con and use context is like a pain in the ass to use, but we don't have to use it anymore because Radix exists. So I think that's that's right. how I think about these things today. And so if you're like a startup and you're trying to make a SaaS app in like the next three months, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like using a framework that basically you're gonna have to use to build another frame, maybe it's not the right decision, right? You just want the fresh data. You want to do what web apps have been doing for 20, 30 years, right? That's where the, that's where the talk comes in and understanding the problem and the values and stuff. So that's my quick opinion right. take at the end. And that is good. Like just to, you could imagine your end progress example, how you have to wire all that up. But if, if there was such an end progress link and it had the ability to work with any exactly. framework, both remix and both next, um, it does, that does feel like a good, that does feel like a nice, like, yeah, maximizing yes. ecosystem, composability across the ecosystem. Right. Um, I, again, I think there's just that, that part of me that's like, you don't have to sacrifice yeah. everything on the, on that altar right. today. To, to but I think, that. again, I think there, there, I feel like I was all opinions this whole episode. No, I like it. It's, that, it's, it's fun. Um, I, I think, I, I do think you're right. I think they're sacrificing a lot on the altar of these things because they believe that functional composition and all these things are the best way to make something that's going to last in the future. And yeah, to, to, to yes. achieve that yes. ecosystem yes. Yes. without, in fact, you can't even, you can't even get that ecosystem because I guess this is like, this would be the, the best way I would argue this, right? Like in, if you, if you don't build a framework that's maximally composable, maximally composable, you end up with a, but maximally yeah. composable, you end up with a bunch of remix packages, a bunch of next right. packages. Like, right. You know how yep. we kind of, we, we end up jQuery with like, rails, oh, next internationalization. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You end up with those now. And again, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily, a bad right. thing, but, but, um, yeah, it's what you said. All else equal. If there was a package that worked with yep. every framework and it was just as easy to work with every framework and, and, and there was no yeah. cost, there was no downside. You didn't lose the ease of use, the right. flexibility, the expected behavior. Um, then you would choose it or it was small, it was right. small, like 
like Radix is is harder to use than something like, to just uh, like React Toast or React whatever. Select, yeah, or React Select React yeah. Toast, right? But the de- but the downside is the cost is not right. as high, and that cost gets cheaper, and cheaper exactly. every year. Yep, great, great way to say it. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Great way to end it. Um, awesome. That was uh, that was a long one um, and a little bit uh, unstructured, but it was fun to go through that again. This is like, it's, it was hard for me to understand this when we first went through it. And I didn't even understand it until last week. And I had this conversation like six months ago, more than six months ago. So I'd like, it was, that was helpful for me, even just saying that out to understand why a global config that re-renders my app 60 frames a second is bad for the ecosystem. Now it makes total sense, right? Um, because right. you can't use React Tweet in you know my next app but you can use it in yours or whatever so pretty interesting stuff right right uh cool all right i think that's it for this yeah it was helpful it was definitely helpful for me too so yeah lots to think about awesome all right well for those still with us thanks a lot for uh, listening if if there's any other follow-up questions anything you want to talk about in the podcast hit us up at front and first fm on twitter otherwise we'll catch you next week bye cool see you